Now that we understand the basics of covariation, let's get into some of the nuts and bolts of how to determine statistical significance. So we're going to talk about the most basic way to determine statistical significance through the use of the chi-square statistic. And as a general overview, we're going to look at degrees of freedom, the chi-square distribution table. We're going to do a couple quick calculations with the chi-square, a couple of examples, and then we're going to look at using and abusing the chi-square statistic. So let's begin. Remember, a test of statistical significance is a test that evaluates if differences in the values of the dependent variable vary across the categories of the independent variable, if those differences are in fact real or significant, or if those observed differences in the values of the dependent variable across the categories of the independent variable could be explained by chance alone. Now earlier we learned about constructing crosstabs to examine the relationship between two variables. And remember, always put the independent variable on the x-axis and the dependent variable on the y-axis. But tests that do not assume an underlying form to the data or a numerical structure are referred to as what's called non-parametric tests. And the chi-square statistic is the most commonly used non-parametric test for statistical significance. Its logic is straightforward, and the calculation of the chi-square statistic is quite simple. In fact, you could calculate a chi-square on any array or matrix of cells, even for interval-level relationships. But there are more precise and efficient ways to examine interval-level relationships. Chi-square is most commonly used for cross-tabulation, and it's very good at looking at statistical significance in simple tables. The logic is fairly straightforward. One of the ways that we can statistically claim that values of the independent variable help us better predict the values of the dependent variable is simply by examining changes to the frequency in which we make an observation of the variable in the rows, the dependent variable, across the values of the variables in the columns. We begin with a null hypothesis. This is to say that we would expect the introduction of an independent variable to provide no increased ability to predict the values of the dependent variable. When you look at the totals column, you're seeing the distribution of the dependent variable by itself, exactly as though you were producing a univariate table for that variable. The percentage of cases of each cell of the totals column will provide the basis for determining the expected cell count for all the values of the dependent variable across the categories of the independent variable. The greater the difference between what we observe and what we would expect if the independent variable had no impact on the dependent variable will produce larger and larger chi-square statistics, and it creates a greater likelihood that we can reject the null hypothesis. So here's the setup. We set up a null hypothesis. We assume that there's no relationship in the population. We're going to calculate the cell frequencies that we would expect to observe if the null hypothesis were true. Then we're going to compare the expected cell frequencies with the observed cell frequencies. The greater these differences, the larger chi-square becomes and the lower the risk of making a type 1 error, rejecting the null hypothesis when we should have failed to reject the null. Then we're going to calculate the degrees of freedom, which is a calculation based on the size of the table or the number of cells in the matrix. The more cells there are in a table, the greater opportunity for observed distributions to depart from expected distributions. So we need to make an adjustment. And finally, once we have our chi-square statistic and our degrees of freedom, we're going to consult a chi-square distribution table to determine our level of significance. Now, if you're using SPSS, it's done automatically for you. Okay, so looking at the chi-square formula, we show simply a summation of how much each cell in a table deviates from an expected value for that cell if the null hypothesis were completely accurate, i.e., if all the cells across all categories of the independent variable had precisely the same proportion of observations across the values of the dependent variable. So in our table here, where we have estimating trust in government by whether R participates in politics, for example, our dependent variable, our first category of no trust, we have 42% of our observations fall into the no trust. And what we would expect, if the null hypothesis is true, then as you go across the no trust through the categories of our independent variable, the level that someone participates in politics, we would expect 42% in each of the none, the sum, and the allot categories. So that would be 42% of the 139 total in that category of the independent variable for none, 42% of the 487 who participate some in politics, and 42% of the 701 who participate a lot, etc.
Second, we're going to need to look at degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom calculation is, is also relatively straightforward. Degrees of freedom are just determined by taking the number of rows in a table, subtract 1, and multiply that number by the number of columns minus 1. The chi-square, of course, gets larger as we move away from what is expected if the null hypothesis is true. But it also gets larger as we increase the size of our table. As we add more cells, there are more opportunities to observe differences between what's observed and what's expected. Degrees of freedom can be determined relatively quickly. For example, look at this table. And in this table, you can see if we have four categories of our independent variable and three categories of our dependent variable, we would have rows 3 minus 1 times columns 4 minus 1. So we would have 2 times 3. This table would have 6 degrees of freedom. Or similarly, if the independent variable has five categories and the dependent variable has four categories, then we would have five minus one times four minus one or 12 degrees of freedom, etc. As I said, when we have our chi-square statistic and when we have our degrees of freedom, then what we're gonna do is we're going to look up our chi-square statistic on a critical value chi-square distribution table. You need to look up your calculator of the chi-square statistic relative to the degrees of freedom that you have. Based on a critical value of chi-square at a given level of confidence, you're going to make the decision to fail to reject or to reject your null hypothesis. So let's use an example. Say we had this 4 by 5 table, and we had generated a chi-square statistic of 22.6. The degrees of freedom for this table is 4 minus 1 times 5 minus 1, or we have 12 degrees of freedom. And if you look here across the row for 12 degrees of freedom, what we're looking for is the critical values of chi-square that we exceed. So our calculated chi-square of 22.6 is larger than 18.549. It's larger than 21.026, but it's not larger than 23.337. That's telling us that we can be at least 95% confident that we can reject the null hypothesis, and there's less than a 5% probability that we would make a type 1 error. Good job. Let's do a simple example. Suppose you wanted to test the claim that parents are more likely to wrap baby girls in pink blankets than they are to wrap baby boys. The dependent variable in this case is whether or not we observe babies to be using pink blankets or not pink blankets. And the independent variable here is the gender of the baby. If there were no relationship, let's say hypothetically that 30 of the babies were, were, were wrapped in pink blankets. If there's no relationship, then we would expect the proportion of babies wrapped in pink blankets to carry a cross gender. Let's imagine what that table would look like. If we took the distribution of babies, 30 wearing pink, 70 not wearing pink, and had a null hypothesis that says knowing the, ba the, the gender of the baby does not help us predict the color of the baby blankets parents prefer to use to wrap their babies, then we would expect that 30% to carry across all observations regardless of gender. So for example, if we have 50 males, we would have expect 15 of 50 or 30% of the males to have pink blankets, and we would expect 15 of 50 or 30% of the females to have pink blankets. That's the idea behind the null hypothesis. That's the expected cell counts if the null hypothesis were true. That's the basis of our chi-square statistic. Let's say we actually observe that 46 boys were not wearing pink blankets, 26 girls were wearing pink and 24 were not wearing pink. We're going to compare that to what we actually expected and we're going to set up a calculation table based on the chi-square statistic. Now remember, the chi-square statistic was the sum of the frequency observed minus the frequency expected squared then divided by the frequency ex expected. So we're going to do this calculation on a cell by cell basis. And so our first cell is R1, C1, the first row and the first column where they intersect. And in this case, so if we look at the first cell, which is R1, C1, which is for boys who are wearing pink, we observe four, but we expected 15. So when we subtract observed from expected, we get negative 11. 4 minus 15 is negative 11, which when squared is 121. And when we divide by our expected cell count of 15, 121 divided by 15 is 8.07. Okay, and you continue this pattern for R1C2, R1C, R2C1, R2C2. 
and you do all of the differences between observed minus expected, square their values, divide by expected, and what you get is this final column over here, which when you add it up, that's the chi-square statistic. The chi-square statistic then needs to consider degrees of freedom. And remember, degrees of freedom is rows minus 1 times columns, columns minus 1. And in this case, we have a 2 by 2 table. So 2 minus 1 times 2 minus 1 is 1 times 1, or just 1. Once you have your chi-square statistic, which was 23.048, and your degrees of freedom, which in this case was 1, you then look it up on a chi-square distribution table. And with one degree of freedom, you can see that 23.048 is greater than our critical value for 90% confidence, where alpha is 0 0.1 of 2.076. It's greater than our critical value for 95% confidence, or 3.841, where alpha is 0 0.5, etc. All the way down to the end of the table, where we've exceeded the value of 10.828, where we would have 99.9% .9 confidence, where alpha is 0 0.01. So because our 23.048 exceeds the 10.828, we know that we're at least 99.9% .9 confident that we could reject the null. And there's less than a 0.1% chance that we'd make a type 1 error if we claim that the gender of the baby is related to the choice of color that parents choose for baby blankets. Outstanding. Let's add some complexity here. Let's make it something that we actually might study in political science. Let's say that we were going back to our original table where we're estimating trust in government by whether R participates in politics. If you look at the yellow column on the end of the table, that's our totals column, and those are the proportions we would expect to carry across all of the categories of the independent variable. For example, we expect that 42% amongst those who have no trust in government, regardless of whether they participate, none, some, or a lot. We expect the 39.5% to carry across the some trust category, regardless of whether some people participate, none, some, or a lot, etc. To make the calculations for expected cell counts, you can multiply the percentage times the column total count. So for example, to determine the expected cell count in R1C1, you take 42% or 0 0.42 and multiply it times the total number of people who don't participate at all in politics, 139. And that gives you an expected cell count of 59.23. In R1C2, we're going to take that 42%, but now we're going to multiply it by the total number of observations among those who participate some in politics. So 0 0.42 times 487 gives us 206.27. In R1C3, it's 42% or 0 0.42 times 701, which gives us 294.49. We're going to continue to do the same thing for R2 and for R3. So R2C1, we get expected cell counts of 55.43, etc., 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 all the way to R3C3. And when you add up all of those observed minus expected squared divided by expected, you're going to get the relative weight for each cell as it contributes to the chi-square calculation. And when you sum down this last column here, in this particular case, you get a chi-square statistic of 10.696. Now, this is a 3x3 three three table. So remember, degrees of freedom, rows minus 1 times columns minus 1. And in this case, 3 minus 1 times 3 minus 1 is 2 times 2, or 4. Remember, we're supposed to start with uh, a hypothesis and a null hypothesis. So the hypothesis we're testing here is the more someone participates in the political process, the greater their trust in government. And our null hypothesis is that there is no relationship between participation in politics and trust in government. Now that we have our chi-square statistic of 10.696 and our degrees of freedom, we can look it up in a critical values of the chi-square distribution table. With four degrees of freedom, our chi-square, our calculated chi-square statistic of 10.696 exceeds the critical value for 90% confidence, where alpha is 0 0.1, of 7.779. It exceeds the critical value for 95% confidence, where alpha is 0 0.5. The critical value is 9.488. But it fails to exceed any of the other critical values. What that's telling us is that we're at least 95% confident that we can reject the null hypothesis when we claim that there's a relationship between how much someone participates in politics
and how much trust they have in government. Now, another way to conceptualize this is visually. Now, the chi-square distribution is always a positive distribution, so it's increasing towards positive infinity. And the critical value for four degrees of freedom with 90% confidence, or where alpha is 0 0.1, is 7.779. So the region off in the tail here is the remaining 10%. And if our chi-square is beyond that critical region, then we're more than 90% confident. And the same is true for the 95% confidence level, where we have to exceed the 9.488. And we have with our chi-square of 10.696. And similarly, we would look at a similar place for 99% confidence, but in this case, we have not exceeded the 13.277. So we're more than 90, we're more than 95, but we're not 99% confident. So that's how you get the conclusion that you're at least 95% confident that you can reject the null hypothesis. Now, there is a way to calculate this with calculus to calculate the area under the curve, but we're going to work under the more simplistic world with these chi-square tables. It's more approachable for people who haven't taken calculus. And when you use your software program, whether it's SPSS or State or some other software program, your software is going to calculate the exact probability of making a type 1 error for you. Okay, great. So let's think about our use of the chi-square statistic and where and when we should use it. Your chi-square statistic assumes that you've hypothesized a relationship in advance. It assumes that you're testing a hypothesis and that therefore you also have a null hypothesis. Remember, at the end of the day, the chi-square is a test of the null hypothesis. Chi-square also assumes your sample is selected at random. It assumes that no more than 25% of your cells have an expected cell count of less than five. And the larger the number of cases, the larger your chi-square statistic will become. And this is as it should be, since a larger sample reduces the risk of a type 1 error, right? You've collected more of the population. But because of this, you can never use chi-square to draw conclusions about the strength of the relationship, since even trivial relationships attain statistical significance if the sample's large enough. And don't forget, we're going to cover measures of association, things specifically designed to tell us about the strength of the relationship. Chi-square is not a test of strength of relationship. Finally, a, a non-significant chi-square doesn't mean that we have an unrepresentative sample. It usually just means that our relationship is so weak, if there is one at all, that it could have easily have been observed by chance. All right, fantastic. So to recap... We've covered statistical significance with the chi-square statistic. We've looked at degrees of freedom. We looked at the chi-square distribution table. We thought about calculating the chi-square distribution with a couple of examples. And we've done some thinking about using and abusing the chi-square statistic. That's a lot, but this is a fantastic way to kind of get your head around what statistical significance is actually doing. And when it makes a probability claim about rejecting the null hypothesis and the risk of making a type 1 error. Great job. Great job with Chi-Square students. What we have coming up next is nominal level association. From that, we're going to go to bivariate and maybe even multivariate by the end of the course. We'll talk to you soon.